Lord, guys, it's great to see you this afternoon. It has been a week of encouragement for me, uh, the pastors, and uh, intern Ian. Where's intern Ian? Right there. We went up to Shepherd's Conference this week. Yeah, let's give it up for intern Ian. There we go. Spent some time up at Shepherd's, Shepherd's Conference. It was good to be up there, uh, to be encouraged, to hear the word preached. And I noticed, like, it's this time in the semester where school for our kids, sports for our kids, church, all these activities, they begin to pile up, and you can feel just sort of that physical, the the dauntingness of all of that, the the physical tiredness that happens. But I noticed this, being around men who agree on the truths of the scriptures, and being around men who are trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do, and being around men who have a like-minded view of God was so encouraging that overcoming the tiredness was a lot easier this week. The more that I found myself surrounded by people who want to do something great for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more I was amped up, focused, ready to go. I hope that's how you and I treat these monthly get-togethers. That it's not simply a check the box, that it's not something that we come to because we have to, but we look forward to this. We come around the same Bible with the same view of God, with the same spirit, to join together to accomplish something great for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just want to ask you that, like, is that really what you want to do? Like, is that your honest heart's desire? That you want to make an impact for the name of Jesus Christ, that that is what you want, and you are willing to do whatever, you're willing to give whatever, you are willing to spend whatever as long as it makes an impact for the name of of Jesus, because to fake that is so, so wrong. Because I want to make a difference. I want my life to matter. I want it to count. I want it to look different than the world around me, and I want it to be something that other Christians can look at and go, that's, that's what it means to live sold out for Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to make an impact on the world. I keep seeing this quote this week, and I think it's so apropos for what we were talking about by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I thought that was good. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Now ask yourself, how's that going? The way you live at work when you get together with family members at these get-togethers that are non-Christians, when you're with friends, when you're out you know, playing sports or hobbies, doing all these things, how is your life making a difference so that when somebody who says, there is no God, they look at you and they go, well, wait a second. Everything that the Bible says this guy believes and everything the Bible tells him to do, he tries to do something. There's difference. There's, there's reality. There's authenticity. There's a genuineness there. And guys, your life will make that impact if you are godly. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And our series has been the idea of making every effort, which I hope encourages you and challenges you and convicts you, that your life as a man should be expended for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and to see all the work that he does by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of the scriptures, change and conform you. And we've had a number of great sermons and a number of great topics looked upon to show us how you're going to make a difference. But this afternoon, we're going to look at the idea of adding godliness. If you live a godly life, I can guarantee you, you will begin to make unbelievers question their disbelief in God. Because the things that the scriptures ask you to do are so antithetical to the spirit of the age that when you genuinely live according to what the Bible says, there is such a stark difference. There is such a a big contrast. There is a, a gap and a gulf between what they live and do and how you live and do, and that will build the platform and the bridge that you need to spread for the gospel and the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to start reading 2 Peter 1, verses 3. We're going to go all the way to verse 7. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory 
and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Listen to verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, guys, let's just conceptually put this together. We had Pastor Matt come up last time, and I hope you were encouraged. I was challenged to take a look at my life and go, am I steadfast? Can I bear the weight of ministry, of service, of leadership? And if I start to practice the things that he was telling me about, absolutely I can. And not only can I do that, I can thrive when I do that. We, we were able to look at things in the past. If you take a look at just some of the lists, we have steadfastness, we have self-control, we have the idea of knowledge, all of these things that we're putting together. But we have to remember, these are not approached in isolation of one another. Because if we, if we come with the mindset that I'm going to come study the, the topic that we're talking about today, and then I'm going to put it into practice for a couple weeks, and then put it off to the side, I'm not getting the benefit of it. We have to approach this like we are putting together, uh, like, like if you, anybody out there, like, anybody like baking desserts or things like that? Anybody like to do that? We bakers out there, can men be bakers? I know a few of you can, bakers out there. Can you imagine, like I love cinnamon rolls. Who loves a cinnamon roll? Just a good, oh, a good cinnamon roll where you have that cream cheese filling that's melting over the top and you got the butter, it's so good. Can you imagine though, if I took the ingredients for cinnamon roll and I put, I put the flour here, and I put the butter here, and I got the sugar here, and I put all the, the ingredients individually on the counter, and I said, great, I've got a cinnamon roll. You would go, that's, that's not how you get it. The product that you want requires that you put them all together. If you come to men's ministry going, okay, we did self-control, now I'm not looking at that anymore. We did steadfastness, I'm not looking at them, and I'm putting them in their individual compartments, I'm never going to get the product that I want. But if I want that product where I come and I look more like the Lord Jesus Christ because I take all of these and I put them together and they're applied together, now that's where the power comes from. If you're noticing that you're not increasing in some of these, maybe it's because you've segmented them off into their individual compartments and that's never the way to approach this. It has to be them put all together. So when we talk and we define the one element that we're talking about today, it is not to the detriment or to the neglect of what we've looked at before, but it's the addition, it's the mixing, it's the combination of them together that's going to give us the product that we want. And this morning, this afternoon, we want to talk about godliness. What do I mean when I talk about godliness? How about a definition? Okay, short and simple. All these other pastors try to impress you with these long definitions. Just a short and simple definition. Listen to this. The definition of godliness is this, a piety that aims at pleasing the Lord. A piety that aims at pleasing the Lord. I don't know if you know the term piety or or pious. It's not a term that we typically throw around nowadays. Back in the old days, it it was a term, and you would think of a a minister. He's a very pious minister. Man, but what do we mean when we're talking about a a, a piety? Let me give you just some synonyms for that. Somebody who's devoted, okay? A devotion, like they're very devoted to what they do. It's almost that religious sense of devotion. They feel a calling of a a divine being and they're devoted to that aspect. There's a, a reverence towards an object or a person that marks this pious nature. There's an honor, an homage almost. Listen to this phrase. There's a spirituality about them. Now, spirituality is vague in a term that our culture loves to use, so let's make that very clear as to what we're saying when it's applied in the Christian terms. If I say I'm a spiritual person, that is a Holy Spirit-filled spirituality and a Scripture-centered spirituality. So that type of person is not vaguely just drifting through some sort of cloud of spirituality. 
they are empowered specifically by the Holy Spirit and directed and guided by the scriptures themselves. So there's a concreteness to what they do when they say, my life is spiritual. And then that's the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is the idea of, of a piety, okay? And when you live piously, devotedly, religiously, with reverence and honor towards wanting to please God, you are living in godliness. Now, guys, do you want to make an impact in this life for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? It will happen when you are godly. You will make unbelievers question their unbelief in God, and you will encourage believers to know that you are dependent upon the living God, living for the glory of God, trying to pass on to the next generation what it means to live for God. So number one on your outline, read it in this way. Let's realize the profound impact of a godly life. Let's realize the profound impact of a godly life. You see it here in a list that Peter has given. God's divine power granted to us all things that pertain to, notice this, life and Godliness. So it started back at the beginning when he was telling us everything comes from God, everything that he's calling us to do, life and godliness, so that life and godliness define how a believer, a child of God, should be living. So that piety that aims at pleasing the Lord happens because God has granted to us all things that pertain to that life and godliness. But that life and godliness is not a, a stagnant or a static category. It is something that we should be adding on and increasing as we saw in the list that continues to build for us. It is something that we make every effort to do that we strive after in this idea of godliness that if I live a pious life that is aimed at pleasing God, I am going to make a difference for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that I hope you and I take extremely seriously. This is a concept that if we do, we will understand that it will make us distinct. When you go to work, when you are in your community, when you are with unsaved family members, when you are out in the world, there should be a distinctiveness about your life. If you look like the world, there is a likelihood that you do not know God. That's very clear from 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things of the world. For whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there is a distinctiveness that should be there. There is a separation that should be there. That's what the impact of a godly life will be. There will be a distinctiveness about you. But let's be vitally clear as to what we mean when we're talking about the idea of us being distinct. Because if we get the idea of distinction wrong or separation wrong, then we're missing out on the profound impact of what a godly life can be. And I'm going to warn you guys up front. I've got a fever. And the only prescription is more subpoints. okay? I have so many subpoints this sermon. The infection that Pastor Matt has has just taken over and riddled my body. We're going to have nine of them today. And I feel unashamed about it, Okay. So because I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to have the record for the most sub points, these ones technically don't have a point next to them. They're just words to write down, okay? So that's how I'm going to get by not having the most sub points. But I'd like you to write down this word right here, okay? Throw it up there, Jeremiah. Isolation, okay? This is wrong when we're talking about the distinctiveness or the separation that the scriptures are giving to us, okay? If I think that I hear the phrase, I need to be distinct, I need to be separate, and that draws me towards isolation where I push myself away from the world, then I'm missing out on what God wants me to be doing as a disciple, as a pilgrim, as a sojourner, as his child in this world. Now notice what is usually associated with that. There is a piety that's out there. There is a religious uh, devotion that's out there that, that aims to really promote the self. And that's what I'm going to isolate. That's the Pharisee who says, I'm going to separate myself. I'm better than this other person. I know that I am because look at all the things that I do. That's not the type of piety that we're talking about here. This is a form of piety, but it's a piety that exists to promote the self and not God. 
So that's something that we are completely saying that's not what we're trying to promote when we talk about the idea of this distinctiveness, this separation. It is not an isolation, okay? If it is an isolation, it's a wrong form. It's taking a wrong turn somewhere when we're thinking about that. But the next line, it's not a pollution, okay? A pollution. Where I look at my life and I say, there's no amount of piety that's going to please God. So my life can look ungodly and God's okay with that. So this pollution is no pious life can please God. Therefore, I'm just going to live my life how I want to live. And that is going to pollute the way that you guys make a difference in the world. And unfortunately, this shows up all the time in American Christianity. There used to be strands of it back in the day where the, the focus on the, the cross-centered life or the gospel-centered life got so bad that people would say Christians literally cannot please God because Jesus has pleased him enough. And to be very sure, when we're talking about the subject of salvation, that's absolutely true. That's how we come into the kingdom of God. There's nothing we could do to please God in our trespasses and sins. But when we are saved, we'll look at a number of texts in a moment, the amount of times that we're called to please God as his children means our life has to be distinct. So we don't want to miss this call for separation or isolation to be the, I'm so separate that I'm isolated and I'm better than other people, or I'm so polluted in my conduct that I don't look any different than the world, because th those are both wrong forms. What we want our piety to be is this, designation. Put that one up there, Jeremiah, designation. We want our piety to designate us as worshipers of God. And when you live that pious life, you will make a profound impact for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ because you are desperately trying to throw the attention on God and do whatever is pleasing to him so that he receives the glory. I want my piety to designate the fact that I worship God. Can you write down Acts chapter, 12, uh, chapter 3, verse 12, and listen to this. I'll read it for you. And pay attention to who's talking right here. Acts chapter 3, uh, starting in... Verse 9. I'll read uh, 3, 6. We'll just start. Okay, uh, Peter, silver and gold have I none. All that I have give to you. The, the lame man's begging for money. Peter goes, I don't have any money, but what I have I'm going to give to you. In the name, notice this, in the name, how explicit he is. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and enter the temple and walking and leaping and praising God. Okay, so now the focus is on God. And all the people saw him walking, praising God and recognized him as the one who sat by the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and awe and amazement at what happened. Notice verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people were utterly astounded. They ran to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the men, uh, the people, and said, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? See that phrase, piety? Same word for godliness we have in our section. What is Peter desperate to do with his life? Designate where any good comes from. The moment anybody sees anything and begins to try to throw the spotlight on him, Peter goes, what are you guys talking about? Do you think that the power to do this lies within me or the piety lied within me that this is an internal, inherent ability that I possess? Or does he go on to say this, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you know and see. And the faith that 
is through Jesus has given this man the perfect health in the presence of you all. He does not want the attention on himself. He is going to designate who he is, a servant of the one true living God, and he wants his life to be a spotlight to the glory of God. So when I say to you, realize the impact that a godly life can have, this means you are spending all your energy to say, my life and any good that comes from it, the piety that is developed in me is aimed at pleasing God and none of it was of me, but of God. And if you do that, you will make an impact for the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who do you worship? Who gets the attention. Who gets all the credit? The humble man realizes nothing on my own do I bring. Simply to the cross do I cling. And if I came in that way, anything that I've been given, I now want to utilize as an opportunity to designate who is holy, who is worthy, who is glorious. Do you want to live a life like that? That's how you make an impact for the rest of your life. It is not about your name, but the name of God. And when you designate praise that way, that's how you make a difference for the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to 2 Peter. That that word piety, Peter's going, no, this is not me. I'm designating who I'm looking at. So when I have this focus on piety, it is never that concept and idea that I want it to be about me. We're going to have some time in the, 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 the situations after with the scenarios. One of those scenarios, I think the one that I'm leading in community, kind of deals with that. How do we be pious at our work without drawing attention to us? How do we make sure that we designate that it goes to God and do so in a way that attracts attention to him and never to us? But back to the text here. We want to add godliness. Now this idea of godliness, what's so interesting is we had that concept of isolation, which will tend towards Phariseeism, and even that idea maybe of, of asceticism where I can be so pious or I can be so, uh, I can put things off so much that I, I look like my godliness is because I can say no to so many things. It's very interesting that where a big conglomeration or a bunch of the words of godliness appear in the Bible is in the pastoral epistles. And over and over again, Peter in the, uh, Paul in the pastoral epistles is trying to denounce a fake form of of godliness as known as asceticism. So it's very interesting that he uses those terms to say if you're seeking to deny the goodness of God in eating food or enjoying marriage and you think that's godly, that's not the way to make a difference for God. Just because you can say no to certain things doesn't mean you're any better than anybody. So godliness is the answer to avoid this pharisaical or this asceticism that says, by me saying no to these things, I'm good with God. I please God. That's not what genuine piety is. The interesting fact about Second Peter, where we are, is it's the opposite strand of what we were talking about, that pollutive aspect, where the false teachers were in Second Peter going, hey, we can do whatever we want. We can live however we want. We have a license to live how we want because of the grace of God. I can live how I want. You can't tell me how I'm supposed to live. And so Peter avoids that pollution by focusing on godliness. So the answer from to avoid legalism or being a libertine is to pursue godliness, a piety that aims at pleasing God. But that should show you that the Bible presents two ways that you could possibly fake godliness. So number two on your outline, avoid powerless forms of godliness. Avoid powerless forms of godliness. There is a legalistic idea that kind of looks like godliness, but it's that isolation that we don't want. And then there's this pollutive aspect that looks like godliness because we're denying, you know, we're, we're denying that I can say no to things and be pleasing to God, but it goes too far in the opposite strand. Peter and Paul both fight these with the same concept of godliness, so we need to avoid the fake forms of godliness. Can you turn with me to 2 Timothy? Let's go look at one of the ideas here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. Let's avoid the fake forms of godliness. Now guys, as I said at the beginning, and listen to what I said, do you want to make an impact 
for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want unbelievers to question their disbelief in God? Take a look at how the culture around you is going to begin to look. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do you guys notice the description of the culture around us? In any way, shape, or form, some form of that is at your work. Some form of that is in your unsafe family members. Some form of that is in your unsafe community where you live. Some form of that is with your unsaved friends. And you must live distinct among those people. If you're going to make a difference for the gospel, you have to live a life that is pleasing to God. You are driven not by a lover of pleasure, but you love God, and that's where you find your pleasure. So you need to make sure that your life is distinct. But notice what he says having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. There is nothing more weak and insignificant than a man with fake godliness. And if you sit here in this room and you put on a veneer of godliness amongst other people, not only will you not make a difference for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, but you are part of the reason why we get lobbied at us Christians are hypocrites. That should never be you. To be sure, there are people who name the name of Christ and are not Christians who give Christians a bad name. But my goal and desire is to never give a bad name or or reputation to what a Christian is. And a Christian is a follower of God, not a perfect one, one who realizes when I sin, I need to confess, I need to repent, I need to make this right because I cannot live in this state. I do not love pleasure more than I love God. I've got to make this correct, but if I have a form of godliness and I deny its power, nothing is weaker or more insignificant than that. I don't know if any of you have done any home improvement projects recently, but just imagine this. Imagine setting up your home with that fake veneer brick. Have you seen that before? You could go to like a a hardware store. Instead of buying real brick to build a home that would be strong and constructed, You can get something that looks a lot like brick, but if you were to just like push through it or to punch through it with a hammer, you could tear it down pretty easy. There's that 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 facade of, of what looks like, wow, that's really powerful and strong. I think that's the idea of what Paul is setting up here. There's a fake form in from a distance. That looks like a, a brick house. I walk up, I could take a hammer and just punch through it because it is a fake form of What should be the true power of the brick? If I want to build something strong, I want that brick and mortar to be united together so that it cannot be toppled over, I've got to have the real form of godliness, the real power of godliness. I think that's one of the ideas of the word here. But interestingly enough, you could take the word either meaning form, it has the appearance of, but it's not really that, or sometimes it's used in the realm of education. So if it's, if it's in the realm of education or being taught this way, this is how you would read it. They've been taught what real godliness is, but they deny its power. And that could be any number of men who sit in a church. They've been taught what godliness is, but they deny its power. Now how does that connect back to 2 Peter chapter 1? How did verse 3 start? His divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You will make no headway in the ability to live a godly life, a piety that pleases God, if I don't have God's power. How do I make sure that I have God's power? Letter A, by understanding the power of the gospel. Understand the power of the gospel. That should be familiar to you if you've been with us. Understand the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So you want to make sure you have real power to practice the piety that pleases the Lord, 
you need to make sure you've been genuinely saved. Guys, can we just pause here for a moment? If you come to this church for any period of time and you go meet with maybe other believers and friends, and sometimes you tell, hey, I go to Compass Bible Church, they'll go, oh, they talk about testimonies there, and they, they get you to question your testimony, which is not true. That's not what we try to do. I don't get you to try to question your testimony, but I do want your testimony to match what the scripture says in regards to somebody who's been genuinely saved. The amount of times that the Bible says, hey, do you, do you know Jesus? Do you know that there are three ways that you can wrongly respond to the gospel? And there's one way that you can have a genuine testimony of salvation. That's the parable of the sower. Shows us that it's important for us to know that we have the the, the, the field that is fruitful, that is going to produce 30, 60, 100 fold. So if I have a vague or improper testimony of how God saved me, that God just kind of did something nice within me, and now I believe in him, that's not what the scripture says is genuine salvation. Do you want the power of God to make sure your piety is pleasing to him? It will be when you said, I repented of my sins. I said, my life is not my own. I know that God has saved me. I could not do it myself. I deserved hell, and God in his mercy gave me his son, and now I have his spirit to live for him. When I'm clear on that, I know that the power I possess is not mine, but God who took me from dead and made me alive. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let her be, understand the power of the Holy Spirit. When you're saved, does God just leave you to do it by yourself? Does he do that? Or does he give you the Holy Spirit, whom the scripture over and over again associates spirit and power? Spirit and power. You can just write down these references. Acts 10, 38. That spoke of Jesus' ability to do the miracles that God called him to do by the power of the Holy Spirit, just to see spirit and power. But listen to Romans chapter 15, verse 13. You can write that down and I'll read it for you. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Guys, do you believe the Holy Spirit's in you? Then you realize any good that happens, any change, you becoming more like Jesus Christ is simply due to the fact that God has deposited his spirit in you. And now that spirit that you depend upon is the one who's conforming you more into the image of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Because when you believe that, you'll start to make a difference for the honor and glory of God, a piety that is pleasing to God because it's dependent upon the spirit of God to accomplish it, letter C, by recharging with the power of the Bible. And you'll see this over and over again in the scriptures. You'll see this over and over again in the scriptures. First Thess, chapter 1, verses 4 to 7, and chapter 2, verse 13, give us that idea. Paul commends the Thessalonians because they did not just receive the word, but they received it with power and the Holy Spirit in much affliction, with full confidence that it was God's word, not just man's. You recharge with that power then you won't have fake forms of godliness. But guys, then we have to realize this idea that Peter has been investing to us back to 2 Peter chapter 1. You just have to come to terms with this idea that you, developing godliness, because God has saved you with his power, he's given you the Holy Spirit, he now has the word, does not make it easy. Please, you have to understand that. There is no ease. The Christian life is simple, but profoundly difficult. It's relatively easy to understand what I should be doing in order to accomplish it, profound difficulty. Not only in me overcoming my own sinful passions, but just in the environment that I find myself in, in the world. So do you want to be a godly man? Do you want godliness to develop in your life? Number three on your outline, write it down this way. Train yourself for godliness. And I can't be more confident of a point because that's literally what Paul says. Train 
yourself for godliness. Peter says it this way, make every effort. Paul says, train yourself for godliness, okay? Write down uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I told you the pastorals had many examples of this word being used there. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6 is this, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Listen, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, have nothing to do with the reverent silliness. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Guys, can you genuinely ask yourself, do I spar about things that are insignificant and stupid and lead me away from finding the true power that's found in the Word of God? Am I in irreverent silliness that really make no difference in impact, or do I concern myself with the things that help me train for godliness? Listen, you do not have to have played sports for any long amount of time to understand the difficulty of training. That's why it's good to get your kids involved in sports, you to be involved in sports, you to be out there and to be involved in some sort of athletic endeavor because the scriptures over and over again use the idea, the word here, train, coming from the word gymnasium, how you go about to develop a skill means you know that this is going to be very, very rigorous. Can you write down Titus 2, 11 and 12? Titus 2, 11 and 12, and listen to this. For the grace of God has appeared, Titus 2, 11 and 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You have to accept and come to terms that it is going to be extremely difficult to do this. You will find yourself tired at points, and that is a good thing because it, if you are pushing in the right direction, that tiredness is going to result ultimately in God strengthening you to have this idea of godliness. Four quick ways to do this. Okay, we're just going to write these down very quickly. Train yourself for godliness by studying doctrine. You have to study doctrine. You will not progress in godliness if you do not study doctrine. So if you say, I'm not a student, I don't like to read, you're telling me I don't like godliness and I don't want to grow to be more like Jesus Christ. That's what you're saying ultimately. Over and over again, you will see in the Bible, listen to how Paul said it to Titus, Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul says, Paul, a servant of God, the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, listen to this, and their knowledge of the truth, doctrine, which accords with godliness. How do you want godliness to develop? It will happen when you have knowledge of the truth, when you study doctrine. You can write down 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. This is doctrine tied to delight in God. It's likely a hymn that uh, Paul took from the early church. It says, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it goes through just really a great summary of the Christian faith. So there's that idea, the mystery of godliness, but it goes through these doctrinal points that you must affirm and believe. Jesus coming, dying on the cross, being empowered by the Spirit, vindicated by the Spirit, all of these different things you have to know. Doctrine. One last reference, 1 Timothy 6.3. 1 Timothy 6.3 says this, if anyone teaches a different doctrine that does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, do you see? Doctrine has to be there. You cannot supplement it with anything else. There's not a separate pill. There's not a separate thing that you can insert into your diet to cover this. It has to be there. You have to study doctrine. Letter B, knowing and desiring the things that please God. Knowing and desiring the things that please God. We won't spend much time here. We'll talk about that in the sermon tomorrow. I love when they come together. We've got to be able to do that. But Ephesians 5, 7 to 10 says this. Ephesians 5, 7 to 10 says, walk as children of light. And that walking as children in light is described as um, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 10. So you've got to know that. Let her see. You have to approach godliness like an athlete. You have to approach it like an athlete, guys. 
If you don't, if maybe you haven't been involved in athletics a lot, you have to think through what is that, what, is, what do you mean by that, Pastor Elliot? Athletes don't get better unless they have intentionality. What do I need to work on today? What did I mess up last game? Where can I grow? What are the attributes that I need to add to the team? There's an intentionality to their study. There's also a grit that's associated with it. There's a grit and a determination that says, I'm going to achieve the goal no matter what. There's a verse in Proverbs that I love. A righteous man falls seven times, rises again, won't stop. I I can't stop. I have to keep going, so I will do that. There's a a grittiness to a godly man, a, a man who pursues godliness that will not be deterred because he has the power of God in him to push him that way. He's also one that rests and reviews his progress. You can't be training all the time. You have to rest. It's literally built into the creation schedule. One day a week, rest, review God's goodness, see how that's gone, recharge, then go out and hit it again. And then you have partners who help encourage you. That's how an athlete does it, right? Athlete that trains by himself, not going to get very far. Have other people around you, you're going to do that. Finally, letter D, though. Focus on God's end game. By focusing on God's end game, when you have a good comprehension of end times, you will be pushed towards godliness. You can write down 2 Peter 3.11. It says this. 2 Peter 3.11, at the end of the book, Peter says this. Since all these things are true, he's just spoken of what God is going to do by the end of the world when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, burns up this heaven and earth and brings the new heavens and the new earth. He says, since all these things are true and, and these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you and I to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Guys, do you focus on that? We as pastors are going to have a, a conference in April, and our desire there is to teach different doctrines to help you guys grow in them. The subject in April is going to be eschatology, which is a focus on end times. Why would we do that? Here's one of the great reasons. When you understand what's going on in God's end game, when he figures out and he's bringing all of his plans to the end, what sort of person ought you to be right now is the response to that. You know, there's different ways, you know, there's the, the old school popular dispensationalism that's always looking for the, 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 the signs that are telling us, oh, is this coming, is that coming? I, I'm not getting in those myths. I'm not getting into that. I'm just looking for God to do what he's going to do. And when I know and trust that he's going to do it, it's going to impact my life right now with holiness and godliness. When I understand God's end game, I see a group of men here. I should see you all at this conference because you're the leaders of your home. You're the one that's putting up the wall. If you want to put up a weak wall, a facade, a fake brick that looks like it could stop an enemy, but really will do nothing, but could be shoved over with a push, then don't show up. But if you believe my job is to lead my family, stand out in my community, help my church, then my godliness is going to increase. And when I do that, it's because I've studied the doctrine, I know what's required of me, and I depend upon the Spirit to go out and do it. Do you want to make a difference for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? It will be when you are a godly man. Let's be a group of men committed to going out to live in front of unbelievers so that they begin to question their disbelief in God, and give them the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Let's go to him right now and ask that he give us the grace to strengthen us in this pursuit. Father, we need you each and every day. Thank you so much, God, for helping us um, see that in and of ourselves we are not capable of doing this, but, Father, to depend upon your power, to strive and toil according to your power. God, help us. God, I I really do pray, as you heard me earlier, do not let this be just a shot of adrenaline in our arms right now, but may it be nutrition that satisfies our souls and strengthens us so we go out and do something with it. God, help us to internalize and by the power of the Spirit, recognize where we need to change, rejoice in the work that you're doing, and go out and be excited to see what will happen if we take serious your call as men to lead. So God, give us that grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.